Good morning, everyone. Stand with me, please. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this room. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves a breath? wish somebody would give him praise and honor in this house. You've been set free. Your friend did this morning. Yeah. Sing this with me. Amazing grace. How sweet. Well, sing it out.
praise right now. We can see today, Jesus. Oh, we've been set free. We can see. Oh, do you feel his presence filling this place? I'm free from the fear of tomorrow. I'm free from the guilt of my past. For I'm traded my shadow. Said I traded my shackles for this glorious song. I said I'm free. Oh, did you hear me? I said now I'm free. Oh, praise God, I'm free. Praise the Lord, free, free, free. At last you unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone. I'm going to say it with us today. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, and I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I'm not. I am a child of God.
And I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Come on, all over this house, say, I am a child of God. Sing it. I am a child of God. If you are a child of God, lift your hands up and sing it. Sing it. I am a child of God. Come on, one more time. Sing it out to him. Say it. I am a child of God. The one who made the blind see is moving here front of me, is moving here in front of me, the one who made the deaf to hear, the silence in my every fear, the silence in my every fear, say this, I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. I believe in you, I believe in you, you're the God of miracles. The one who does impossible is reaching out to make me home, is reaching out to make me home. The one who put death place his life is flowing through my veins his life is flowing through my veins I believe in you I believe in you you're the God of miracles I believe in you I believe in you you're the God of The 
says this, he who comes to God must first, somebody help me, believe that he is. Does anybody believe that he is? I said, does anybody believe that he is? I still believe in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I still believe in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. All things were made by him and nothing that is made was made without him. In verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. I don't know about you, but I believe that he is. That's the first thing you have to do if you're going to come to God. He that comes to God must first believe that he is. Secondly, you must believe that he is a rewarder of those who do diligently seek after him. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. I, I, I don't want you to judge your brother. I don't want you to judge your sister. I, I want you to judge yourself. The Bible said that we're not to compare ourselves one to another, for this is not wise, but let each man test his own actions then he can have rejoicing in himself alone without comparing himself to others. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to ask yourself a question. This morning, obviously, you believe that he is. Most of you would not be here if you did not believe that he is. If you didn't believe that he is, you'd have went fishing or you'd have went golfing or you'd have stayed in the bed and slept. You came this morning because you believe that he is. The second phase is that you must believe that he's a rewarder of them who do diligently seek 
after him. I want to ask you, I want you to ask yourself this question. In the last 22 minutes since this service has been called to order, in the last 22 minutes since this service has been called to worship, have you just stood there and been a spectator? Have, have you let your mind wander with the cares of life and the deceitfulness of riches and the pursuit of other things? Or can you say, I have diligently sought after him with my song this morning. I have diligently sought after him with my worship this morning. I have diligently sought after him with my praise this morning because I promise you this, when a people believe that he is and a people believe that he rewards those who diligently seek after him and they go after God with all their heart, you can be assured that in that moment, in that hour, in that setting, and in that people, the God of heaven and earth will come down and show himself mighty. The question this morning is not will God come down the question is will anybody push aside the cares of life and diligently seek after him if you want to seek him with your worship this morning one more time why don't you clap your hands and shout why don't somebody wave to him why don't somebody wave to him come on why don't somebody wave to him and give him praise Come help me. My 
good God in heaven, this is wrong. I believe he's a God of miracles. I said I believe he's a God of miracles. And I release the supernatural power and presence of almighty God. My good God, my good God, somebody see. you need a miracle or you didn't step out and get in that water right there and I, I, I hope that you didn't just sit there if your family, if your life, if your loved ones are in a place where they need a miracle, lay your hands on them help them, help them, help them, God touch them and do what only you can do touch them and do what only you can do Hi, before we move in a different direction if there's anybody else that needs somebody to believe with you for a miracle, you need to get out of your seat and step in the aisle and let somebody lay hands on you very quickly if anybody else needs a miracle, I believe in you. 
If anybody comes to God, he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who do diligently seek after you. Father, this morning, when, when that little 15-year-old kid walked in this building and grabbed my arm and said, Pastor, I need you to pray for my family. She wasn't reaching out to me. She was reaching out to you. Yes. 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 She, she grabbed my arm because she believed in you, oh God. And I thank you that you are moving in her family situation even now. And God, every person that has stepped out of their aisle and came to this altar, it's not because they believe in the church. It's not because they believe in the preacher, nor the prophet, nor the psalmist, nor the choir. But they've stepped out because they believe in you. And they believe that you're a rewarder of those who do diligently seek after you. God, I pray that you would anoint their lives from the crowns of their head to the soles of their feet, that you would make all of their plans to succeed, that no weapon formed against them would prosper. God, I declare over their lives that greater is he that is in them than he that is in the world, that you, O oh Lord, were wounded for their transgressions, bruised for their iniquities, the chastisement of their peace was thrust upon you, and that with your stripes they are healed. I call perfect health to rule and reign in their bodies. I bless the Lord this morning, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. I bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all of your benefits. You forgive our iniquities. You heal our diseases. You redeem our life from destruction. You crown us with loving kindness and tender mercies. You satisfy our mouth with good things that our youth may be renewed like that of the eagle. Lord, I believe in you and your desire to bless your people. And I pray today that not one prayer uttered in these altars would go unmet but that your supernatural hand would provide would bring peace and would bring prosperity in Jesus precious holy and wonderful name and all of God's people said and if you believe it clap your hands and give him the best praise you can give him hey 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 My, 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 my. Turn, turn to two or three of the neighbors beside you and tell them, I believe in him. Come on, say it, say it, say it. My goodness. You can be seated if you can. If you, if you just keep praying as long as you want to pray. But if you're able, you can be seated in the house of the Lord. Listen, we're glad that you've come here to worship this morning, I hope you sense the presence of one greater than Moses. Does anybody sense the presence of one greater than Moses? Yes. I, I, he, he's, he's greater than Elijah. What, what, the Bible says one greater than Solomon has come. And his name is Jesus. And he cares for you. And he's on your side. And it's his desire to give you the very desires of your heart. Psalm 37 and 4 says if you delight yourself in him, he will grant you the very desires of your heart. And I pray that your heart would be satisfied by his presence in Jesus' wonderful, holy, and mighty name. And all of God's people said Amen and amen. Listen, we are honored that you've come once you made the decision to go to church this morning. You could have went anywhere in this world that you wanted to go. You could have went to First Baptist. You could have went to United Methodist. You could have went to the First Apostolic Pentecostal Church. You, you could have went anywhere you chose to go, but you chose to come to 1846 Volunteer Drive to the South Cleveland Church of God. And I want you to know we are honored that you've chose to come and worship with us in a it's our prayer that when you leave this house, you will say, the time that I invested in worshiping with that community of faith was well worth it. I worshiped him. I heard his word. He touched my life, and I will never be the same again. If it's your first time to be with us this morning, or maybe it's not your first time, but, but it's your first time in a long time. I, I, I met a good-looking gentleman that came in the front door that told me he used to come here years ago, uh, Brother DeFreeze. Now, now, he told me he was your second cousin. Is that right? Right. Brother DePriest, I told him we wasn't going to hold that against him. Come on in anyway, and we're just thrilled and honored to have him. So maybe it's your first time, or maybe it's your first time 
in a long time. We'd like to place a contact card in your hand so we would have your information and be able to minister uh, to your life. Along with that, we want to give you a gift card and buy your breakfast one day this week. So if you're here and it's your first time to be here, if you'll slip your hand up very quickly, our ushers will come to you. It'll just take a moment. Do we have any first-time visitors in the house of the Lord with us in the balcony? If you're there, wave your hand. Somebody needs to, there's somebody, give her a hand. Tell her you're glad to have her with us. Listen, somebody needs to invite your friends and family to turn to your neighbor and say, you should have invited somebody this morning. The, the scripture says this, how shall they believe in whom they have not known? And how shall they know in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear unless there be a voice, unless there be a witness? And, and it's not just the voice of the preacher we believe in the priesthood of all believers around here. You are called to be a voice. You are called to be light that is seen and salt that is tasted. So get out and invite your friends and family back to the house of the Lord. And we're expecting God to come and do great things. I'm telling you, I walked in this morning when this choir was singing and they made me shout. They just blessed my sanctified soul. So I want you to give the South Cleveland Choir a hand as they get ready to come and lead you into the presence of the Lord this morning.
Say something with me this morning from the book of 2 Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Let's try it again. God has not given us a spirit of fear. This wasn't on my heart when I had a different devotion for offering today, but this morning in our Sunday school class, we talked about how Jehoshaphat was facing fear when the enemy came against him, and he took his fear to the Lord. We've been singing songs this morning with a theme of overcoming fear. Right. And in my heart came the thought that some of us, we don't give like we should to God because of fear. The Bible tells us to be a cheerful giver, not a fearful giver. We're just saying that God is Jehovah Jireh, the one who provides. I want to encourage us today, step out in faith in your giving. Don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. God, who is the provider, will give to us and he will bless you. I think of the woman who gave her what? The only two mites that she had, she put into the offering. Amazing faith. Let's give today. I challenge you to give out of faith, overcome the fear, and just trust God and see what he will do. Let's pray. I thank you, God, that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. God, I remember today, I think back today of all the ways you have provided in my life, all the way you have provided in my family's life, all the way you have provided in this church, all the testimonies that are among us. God, help us to move out of fear in our giving. Help us to move into faith. God, give this church the greatest season of giving that we've ever known before because if we will do that as a result we will see blessings we've never experienced before in Jesus name we pray amen to praise if you believe he's great come on come on somebody ah they're still getting money in the back amen nothing the preacher likes more than a long offering i remember when i planted my first church just keep getting that money back here i remember when i planted my first church i was 23 years old my wife had just turned 20 we had nine people i put my tithe in i handed it to my mama my mama passed it to my aunt and we were finished glory to god I'm, I'm glad it's taking a little longer to take the offering at South Cleveland Church of God. Somebody shout amen. 
Hallelujah. Open your Bibles with me very quickly to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. I know you've been standing for a long time during worship, but I'd like you to stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word today. 2 Chronicles, chapter 20. I want to talk to you just very briefly today. If God will help me, I want to preach about 20, 25 minutes, and I want to talk to you about worship, walk, and war. Worship, walk, and war. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Look with me at just one verse, and I will build the narrative to this story as I'm preaching through this message. I'm not going to read the whole narrative, just, just verse 12. O oh, our God, Will you not judge them? Have you, have you ever prayed that prayer? God, are you going to do anything about that person? Huh? Now, now some of you are acting all spiritual like you've never prayed that prayer. I, 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 played a, I think I've preached a message here. If I've not, I will preach a message here in the future about that country western song that says, I'll pray for you. Have I preached that here? I, I pray your brakes go out when you're driving 110. I pray a window pot falls from the window sill and all, all these things that people pray sometimes. Listen, when, sometimes when the, you didn't want the psalmist David praying against you. The psalmist David prayed prayers like this. Lord, would you break the teeth of my enemies? Huh? H have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Oh, God, would you just, some of you have probably prayed that about the preacher in your past. God, would you break the teeth of my enemy? Listen to what Jehoshaphat says. He says, oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. Has anybody ever felt that way? I, I, anybody ever felt overwhelmed? Anybody ever felt like you was pressed hard on every side? That everything that could go wrong was going wrong? That people were forsaking you left and right and there seemed to be no help, no hope for you? I want you to listen to Jehoshaphat's words. And I've got a feeling you've prayed this prayer. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. Listen, listen to his next words. We do not know what to do. A a anybody ever been there? Now, now, I know that we like to make people think that we are super spiritual and that we've got a direct hotline to God and that we know everything we need to do before it ever happens. How many has ever met somebody that tries to act that way? Now, now, now I know that there are, there are scriptures that declare to us that God will direct our path. But how many know sometimes when he's directing your path, you have no idea where he's taking you? That's right. He, he said, Lord, we've got no power to face this vast army that's taking us, and we don't know what to do. Oh, but listen to his last phrase. But, oh, Lord, our eyes are upon you. I've got news for you. When, when you don't have the power to face the situation that's coming against you. When, when you don't know what to do, when you, don't need to, when you don't know if you need to turn left or right, go fast or go slow, stand up or sit down, I've got news for you. The best thing you could do is not go down to the local counselor or the local psychiatrist or the local psychologist and find out what they think you ought to do. Nothing against any of those offices. They provide great help and great ministry. But you hear me. When, when you're facing a great army and you don't have the power to face them and you don't know what to do, the, 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 the number one thing you need to do is not turn on Dr. Phil. Here, here about four months ago, my wife walked in the house one day and Ethan was sitting on the couch. Now listen, Ethan was, he's 11 years old at that point. He's sitting on the couch and he is engrossed in Dr. Phil. My wife said, what are you doing? He said, this guy's trying to help people. <laughs> Listen, what, when, when you don't know what to do, you don't need Dr. Phil. Somebody shout amen. But when you don't know what to do, you had better follow the prescription given here by Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat said, we don't have power to achieve. We don't have power to overcome. We don't have any direction. We don't know what to do. But, oh, Lord, 
our eyes are upon you. Somebody shout amen if you think that's a good idea. Slip your hands to heaven all over this building. Father, I pray you'd anoint me in the next 25 or 30 minutes to help this congregation understand that when they are being overwhelmed, when they have no power to face what's standing in front of them, and when they don't know what to do, if they'll just, oh, if I was Brother Moody, I'd sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look close in his glorious face, and the cares of life will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory. Glory and grace. God anoint us today to turn our eyes upon Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. So I want to talk to you about three, three necessities for success in every believer's life. Now, how many in this place want to be successful? Now, about half of you lifted your hand. I don't know what the other half of you are thinking. I mean, sometimes I shake my head. I'm preaching things, and you ought to be getting it. You're not getting it, and I just shake my head. I, half of you said you want to be successful. What do the other half of you want? Listen, for, for, for some reason, especially in the circles of classical Pentecostal people, we have gotten the idea that to be successful means to be non-spiritual. If, if you grew up in the old Pentecostal church, you, you were preached to an idea and a theology that said this, if you want to be humble, you got to be poor. Hello? Now, I got news for you. Being poor don't make you humble. Being poor just makes you poor. Amen? It, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to be successful. Listen, I've got news for you. God wants you to succeed. As a matter of fact, if God will help me in the month of September, we're going to declare the month of September a, 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 a season of success at South. And I'm going to preach to you about being successful spiritually, being successful physically. A bunch of you need to be here to hear that message. I'm going to tell you you need to put down that donut and Coca-Cola and start drinking ice water. Somebody shout amen. I know you're going on a vacation that day. I, I was sitting at the dinner table the other day with my 180 men, and Brother David, he's my director. He's been with me 15 years, and, 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 and he, he'd been losing a little bit of weight. Brother David's a big man and a strong man. He, he'd been losing a little bit of weight back a few weeks ago and a few months ago, and, and I looked at him, and I said, Brother David, are you still losing weight? You've you got to understand, this man has spent the last 15 years preaching to people that God will set you free from drugs, and he knows it because 15 years ago, God set him free from a crack cocaine addiction. God gave him his family back gave him his children back and for the last 15 years he's been walking in perfect victory you ought to clap your hands and shout amen but but David David was sitting there my director was sitting there he's looking at me and I said David are you still losing weight he dropped his head he said pastor I got back on the coca-cola huh I mean, I mean it was like an alcoholic telling you he'd got back on the whiskey or or a cocaine man telling you he he said I got back on the Coca-Cola. Listen, in September, we're gonna talk about success at South spiritually, physically, relationally, financially. And I want you to hear me this morning. There's nothing wrong with being successful. God wants you to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Blessed when you go in and blessed when you come out. Psalm 37 and 4 says he gives you the desires of your heart. Psalm 20 says he will make all of your plans to succeed. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. In that law doth he meditate day and night. That man shall be like a tree that's planted by rivers of living water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall not wither. Listen to this. And whatsoever he doeth, it shall prosper. It shall succeed. God wants you to be successful. If you believe it, clap your hands and give him praise and glory in this house this morning. He, now, now, for everything you do in life, there are certain things that are necessities. I've preached my water away from me. There's an open one down there on the ground. Give me that one. For everything you do in life, there are certain things that are necessities if you're going to succeed. Have you ever tried to make chocolate chip cookies without chocolate chips? H how many know if you're going to bake the pastor chocolate chip cookies? H 
how many know if you're going to do that? You, it's a necessity that you have what? Chocolate chips. Now listen, if, if you are going to come to Chatta Valley Golf Course tomorrow at 5 o'clock for golfing with the bishop, it, you, you can't do that successfully unless you have golf balls. You need to have golf balls if you're going to golf. They are a necessity. Now listen, on September the 24th at the South Cleveland Church of God, we're going to have an auction for world missions. We're, we're attempting to raise a minimum of $25,000. I've got news for you. We can't do anything for world missions unless you start bringing items for us to auction. Somebody say, I'm bringing something, Pastor. Ugh. That was terrible. <laughs> I, now, now, we did have somebody bring something this week. Who, who brought this, Brother Long? Huh? Troy, are you in the building? Where are you at? Now, listen, br Brother Long back there brought this. It, it's a Pittsburgh Steelers helmet, and it's signed by Mean Joe Green. How many remember old Mean Joe Green? I mean, they don't play football like he, like he played football anymore. Now, I think, Brother Long, I think we can sell this here. If, if we were in Dallas, Texas, where I've spent my life, and, and you bought this, I'd have, I'd have somebody meeting me at the back of the door saying, I'll give you $5,000 to throw that thing in the trash. I mean, Cowboys loathe the Steelers the way you and I loathe the enemy or so, but we've got that. It's got four or five great signatures on it. Brother, Brother Tony has come by this week and given two $500 values for your house to have the carpets cleaned in it. And we've got several people that have done something. Robert's brought us another rifle this week, but we need all of you. It is a necessity if we're going to raise money for world missions for all of you to get involved. There are things that are necessities in life if you're going to be successful. And I want you to hear me and hear me well as a Christian today. Day, if you're going to be successful in life, if you're going to be successful as a believer, you're going to have to learn to do these three things. And do these three things in this order. You're going to have to worship, you're going to have to walk, and you're going to have to war. Everybody say this with me. Say, I must worship. Say, I must walk. And I must war. Now, 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 you hear this. We've got to worship, we've got to walk, and we've got to war. Now, as Pentecostals, as Charismatics, sometimes we want to fast forward past the worship, and we want to fast forward past the walk, and we want to get right to war. I mean, it is a staple of who we are as Pentecostals. Once you as a Pentecostal learn John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and once you learn Acts chapter 2, that when they were gathered together in one room and one accord, suddenly there came a sound from heaven the next verse you learn is Ephesians chapter 6. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We are people of spiritual warfare. And sometimes as Pentecostals, we want to skip the process and get right to the place. If you believe that, shout amen. Now, how many believe that God has a special place for you and your loved ones in life. Do you believe that? Do, do you believe Jeremiah 29 and 11? I know the thoughts, the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and to give you a future. I want you to hear me. Just like God had a place for Israel when he brought them barreling out of Egyptian bondage, God has a place for you. God had a promised land for Israel, and he has a promised place for for you and I, that place is a place of blessing. It's a place of strength. It's a place of anointing. But the place of God's promise, hear this statement, the place of God's promise always demands a prepared people. Three of you got that. The place of God's promise demands a prepared people. If you walk into God's destiny for your life, and you have not been preparing for that destiny, you, it's likened unto trying to put new wine into old wineskins. What happened? Somebody help me. It burst. And everything God had for you leaks out on the ground, and the people around your life become recipients of that. A prepared, God's promised land demands a prepared people. According to Exodus chapter 19, verse 1, Israel comes barreling out of Egyptian bondage, and they reach the foot of Mount Sinai in the third month after the Exodus. Now, now you've got to think this in the whole time frame of 40 years in the wilderness. It took them only three 
three months to reach the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses is going to wind up climbing that mountain on eight different occasions to confer with God about this land of promise during his sixth ascent up that mountain. You can read the account in Exodus chapter 24. It's the first of two 40-day stays that Moses will have on that mountain. God gives Moses two things that are absolutely necessary for Israel if they are going to enter the promised land. Listen to this next statement. The land was ready for the people, but the people were not ready for the land. Ooh. I I said the land was ready for the people, but the people were not ready for the land. I wonder how many times we're saying, God, why haven't you done this? God, why hasn't that door opened? God, why hasn't this taken place? And you think you're waiting on that to happen, and it's really God just waiting on you to get to the place where you are spiritually mature enough to handle and sustain that which he wants to do in your life. Somebody say, I must be committed to the process. That, so, so, so two things that God had to give them. What were those two things? What did God give Israel when Moses made that sixth ascent up that mountain? He, God gave Israel the tabernacle and God gave Israel the tablets. What was the tabernacle about? The tabernacle was about worship. It was about learning to posture yourself in a place of humility before God where you bow down and declare, God, you and you alone are worthy of praise and worthy of worship. So the tabernacle is about worship. What were the tablets about? The tablets were about walk. The tablets told you how you needed to live your life. And I know that we're living in a day of hyper grace and everybody declares New Testament, New Testament, New Testament. Don't worry about anything in the Old Testament. But do you realize that if the United States of America would go back to living by the Ten Commandments, it would change this country in an unprecedented fashion. The Ten Commandments, the tablets that God God gave Israel on that mountain, taught people how they need to walk before God, and it would do good for this country to get back to living by those commandments. But I've got news for you before you clap all excited about it. The reason the country is not living by the commandments is because they have failed to see the church living by those commandments. And it's time we go back to the foot of Mount Sinai and God t- say, God, teach us how to walk one more time. If you believe it, clap your hands and shout amen. So so two things happen on that mountain. The tabernacle worship, the tablets walk, and then when Moses descends from that mountain, God then says to Moses in Numbers 1 and 3, now it's time for you to number the warriors. So here's, here's the pattern. Here's what God is saying. First you worship. Then you walk, then you war. You are not qualified to war until you learn how to worship and you learn how to walk. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever watched anybody that would attempt to engage in spiritual warfare and that person really had never learned to worship and learned to walk? You ever seen that happen? As a pastor, I've watched it happen time and time again. People attempting to engage in spiritual warfare that have not really become people of worship and people of walk. And I've got news for you. No more than a baby that does not know how to walk can go out and grapple and fight a world champion champion grapple. Can a person who has never learned to worship and walk engage in spiritual warfare? The classic example of this is in Acts, the 19th. Chapter. Most of you know the story. In verses 11 and 12, the Bible says that God was doing exceedingly great miracles through Paul, so much so that they began to anoint the handkerchiefs and the aprons of people, and they would take them home. And anyone who touched the handkerchief or the apron of Paul who was sick or afflicted or bound or possessed would be set free. Verse 13 says this that there were some Jews who tried to invoke the name of Jesus over 
over a man who was demon possessed. We know these Jews as the seven sons of Sceva. Listen, the seven sons of Sceva, they were the son of a priest, but they themselves had never been people of worship and they had never learned to walk before God. And what they did according to the scripture is they went to a man that was demon possessed. Um, And listen, if you think that demon possession is something that is gone today and that it's not something the church has to deal with today I've got news for you there's demonic activity all around this world and it may just be that the church has not had enough light in them to expose the darkness and God wants us to get back to be in a church that is filled with light somebody shout amen here's what the seven sons of Sceva did they they looked at that man that was demon possessed and they said I adjure you by the name of Jesus they used the right formula Charlie that, that they didn't use the name of Buddha, nor Mohammed, nor Allah. They said, I adjure you by the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And they demanded that those demons come out of that man. Go, go home and read the text and see what happens. The Bible said the demon-possessed man jumped on them. He beat them. He wounded them. Listen, He stripped them of their clothes and caused them to run away bleeding, bruised, and naked. What was the problem? Why did it not work when he tried to engage in spiritual warfare? The Bible said that those demons looked at him and they said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who in the world are you? Listen to me. If you're not a person of worship and if you're not a person that walks right before God, you really do not have an identity with the enemy. And because you don't have an identity with the enemy, the enemy doesn't do what you tell him to do. But when you find yourself in a place of worship that changes the way you walk and you build a relationship with God through his holy word on a daily basis, all of a sudden not only does God know who you are, but the devil himself knows who you are. And when you wake up, you make him nervous. You cause anxiety to fill his being. God wants you to get to a place where the enemy of your soul knows who you are. If you believe that, shout amen. I'm aware that I'm in Cleveland, Tennessee and not in Dallas, Texas. And probably no one in this room is going to know this man when I call his name. Maybe someone will. Does anybody know who Brother Hibbert was? Uh, Well, you're you're from Dallas. Of course you know who Brother Hibbert was. J.C. Hibbert was probably one of the greatest men of God that have ever walked on the face of this earth. He he built a mega church in Dallas, Texas, when there was no such thing as a mega church. It's called the Gospel Lighthouse. Listen, there, there are stories about that man that will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. I was personal friends with his grandson, with the church, with his grandson at the Corsicana Church of God. So I had an intimate relationship with someone that was so close to him. And I heard so many stories about him. One of the great stories that everybody in Dallas knows about him is when he began to build this building out on Spur 408 in Dallas, Texas. Listen, he was fixing to build a multi-million dollar building. And this is back in the 60s and the 70s when multi-millions of dollars was a whole lot of money. And he told the church, God is going to build this building through the people and the laity of this church. He is going to bless you. He is going to prosper you. And God is going to do it with nickels and dimes. And we're going to build this building debt-free. He gets into the process of building the building. They come to a place where they're stalemated. They have to stop because the finances aren't coming in the way they need to be. Brother Hibbert's concerned. Am I going to be shown to be a false prophet? Did I I miss God? A guy stops at his church on a Friday, walks in his office, says, I'm a multi-millionaire. I've got more money than I know what to do with. I heard you building this church. He slid a check to Brother Hibbert across his desk, and he said, you write out the number for whatever you need to write it out for. Brother Hibbert looked at him slid that check back to him and he said I don't know who you are and I don't know where you came from but I don't want some man that I don't know who he is and where they come from taking the credit or the glory for what God is going to do in this house. God is going to build this house with nickels and dimes. Now listen if you're wondering if I would do the same thing I dare you to challenge me. Hello. I dare you to walk in my office and slide a blank check across my desk. You better not tell me to write whatever I want to write unless you got a lot of money in there. Somebody shout amen. 
But Brother Hibbert said, you take that check. I don't need your money. God is going to build it with nickels and dimes. Can I tell you, God built that building with nickels and dimes. And for the last 50 years, it's been a lighthouse that's led more people to the saving knowledge of Jesus in Dallas, Texas than any other single church. I'm telling you, Brother Hibbert was the man. And Probably my favorite story about Brother Hibbert goes something like this. Well, one day a gentleman came to the church and Brother Hibbert was not there. And the gentleman told the secretary, I I'm, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, I'm, I'm, something is overcoming me and causing me to want to take my life and be fearful and, and I don't understand what's happening. The secretary discerned that he had a demonic spirit. The secretary called the, 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 the support staff, the associates, and the youth pastor, and the, and the psalmist, and said, I want y'all to go pray for this man. He, he's got a demonic spirit. And they, they went, and they began to pray for this man in the back room of the church. Now, I'm, I'm going to get off track and tell you a side note of this story because it's absolutely hilarious, and it is, this story is absolutely true. It really happened. It's not for preaching. Say, while these people were praying for this man to get him free, a gentleman came by that was a gentleman that felt like he was called of God to be a thorn in the pastor's flesh. Now listen, if anybody here, if you're new around here and you feel like your mark, your calling, what distinguishes you from other people is that you are called to be a thorn in the side of the pastor, I wish you'd find another pastor. Somebody shout amen. But every church has got these people. And, and he came in and he said, where's Brother Hibbert? And he's talking to the secretary. He said, I need to talk to him. I didn't agree with something he preached on Sunday. And she said, well, I tell you what, Brother Hibbert's not here, but the staff are trying to get a man free in the prayer room. Why don't you go to the prayer room and help them pray for him? He said, I believe I'll do that. He had no intention to do it. He was going to walk into the sanctuary and go out the side door. He walked into the sanctuary. The staff had brought the demon-possessed man into the sanctuary to pray for him and they, they, they tell this story as absolute truth. The man that was demon possessed when he saw the church troublemaker walk in the back door, the demon spoke and said oh brother Jones I'm so glad to see you. All these Christians are driving me crazy. My good God in heaven. I'm telling you right now it was an amazing thing. that They prayed for this guy for hours. They couldn't get him free. Finally the assistant pastor said I'm going to go call brother Hibbert. He, he said that to himself. He left the prayer meeting, went and called Brother Hibbert, came back into the sanctuary, started praying. About 15 minutes later, as they're praying for that man who's demon-possessed, the demon speaks to the man and says, who called him? The pastor looked at him and said, what do you mean, who called him? The demon said, who called Hibbert? I feel him. That demon felt the man of God when he pulled up in the parking lot. Now, you listen to me. If you are going to be a person that has power, and how many know the Bible says he's given you power to tread up on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? I want you to hear me. If you are going to be a person that has power over the darkness that's attempting to destroy your life, the life of your children, the life of your family, and the life of your loved ones, you're going to have to get in a place of worship and walk where you gain an identity not just with God but with the enemy of your soul that causes him to let your people go when you command him to in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, you ought to clap your hands and praise, praise him. You, you can't you, you can't war if you don't worship. Not only can you not war if you don't worship, listen to me you, you can't walk right if you don't worship. Have you ever met someone who was trying to live by the teachings of this book, but they were trying to do it by their own strength, by their own willpower, by their own tenacity, and they were trying to use this book as a moral compass, and they wanted to walk right, but they had never really became a person of worship. Listen, if you try to live by this book and you try to walk right, but you're not a person of worship, you know what you're going to become? You're going to become a miserable individual. Hello? I've had people ask me all of my ministry, why are there so many miserable people filling Pentecostal church pews? The church this morning across this country is filled with miserable people. 
People who are bitter, people who are sour, people who are discouraged, people they won't smile no matter what in the world you, you say to them. And people ask me all the time, why are so many church people so miserable? Listen, it's because when you try to live a life that takes the Spirit to anoint you to live and you try to do it in the power of the flesh, you become frustrated, you become angry, and you become bitter. Listen to me. You cannot walk right unless you are a person of worship. Hear me today. It becomes the dilemma of Romans the seventh chapter. What is the dilemma of Romans the seventh chapter, Brother Lipsy? Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, I want to do right. I desperately want to do the right thing, but every time I want to do the right thing, I do that which I do not want to do. He says, I don't understand what's taking place in my life. I want to do something that's going to bless somebody, but every time I try to do the right thing, there's a war working in my body, and even though I I want to do the right thing. I do the wrong thing. Every one of us have been exactly where Paul is in Romans, the seventh chapter. We want to do the right thing, but we do the wrong thing. And he ends the seventh chapter with this phrase. But thanks be unto God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you've got to understand what's happening. In Romans, the seventh chapter, you're hearing a man that's trying to walk out a relationship with God without the power of the Spirit. He wants to do right, but he can't do what's right and it's causing him to become frustrated. But at the end of the seventh chapter, he makes a transition. He makes a change. He says, no longer am I going to try to do right by willpower, but I'm going to transition my life and I'm going to become a person of worship and I'm going to say thanks be unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ who giveth us the victory. And as soon as he transitions from trying to live by God's law in the power of the flesh and he starts being a person of worship the, 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 the flow of his penmanship changes and he says there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus it makes me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and of sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in you and I who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit what is Paul saying Paul is saying that if you'll really get down to business with God and you'll become a person of worship and you will take a position that postures yourself in a place where you're prostrate before him and you're honoring his name and giving him praise and giving him glory all of the sudden out of that posture God anoints you and he gives you the power to begin to walk a life that is holy and upright before him mm. so you, you can't war unless you know how to walk and you can't walk unless you know how to worship L listen to me worship is the fountainhead of every spiritual victory. Worship is the fountainhead of everything we walk out. Worship is the fountainhead of everything that we move through. Everybody say worship first. You, you, you can't walk this life without worshiping. Worship has to be first. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Word reaches Jehoshaphat that the, he was the king of Judea, and, and, and word reaches him that three armies, the army of Ammon, the army of Moab, and the army of Seir, three kingdoms, have come together in a, in, a, in a devilish trinity to attack the people of God. Jehoshaphat is overwhelmed. He's aware that his army is no match, and he cries out to God, and he says, Lord, we do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Listen to me. And, I, and I've got 45 minutes of preaching left that I'm going to do in 10 minutes. Listen to me. You, you, you've got to get to the place in God where you trust Him with your life completely and that even when you do not know what to do, you put your eyes upon Him. Somebody shout amen. Listen, I, I, I could preach for hours on biblical proof text of this theory, of this philosophy, of this idea that you've got to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Huh. 
My goodness, my goodness. I, I said you've got to turn your eyes upon Jesus. You, you've got to look close at his wonderful face. And when you do, the cares of life. Everybody say the cares of life. They grow strangely dim. How many know sometimes the cares of life are illuminated around us? And when the cares of life are illuminated around us, Brother Lee, do you know what happens to us? We get like Jehoshaphat and we don't know what to do. But instead of saying we don't know what to do and our eyes upon you, we get to the point where we say we don't know what to do and we get panicked and we live in a life of chaos and we live in a life of anxiety and worry and we can't sleep good and our sleep is not restful and our food does not taste good and we live our lives troubled. But when Jehoshaphat got in a place of trouble and he got in a place where he didn't know what to do. He said, oh Lord my eyes are upon you. Do you remember the story when Peter walked upon the water? How many remember that story? I know everybody gives Peter a hard time because he sank. Peter was the only one that had faith to get out of the boat. Hello? How many know it's easy to judge and criticize the person that is sinking in the water when you're sitting in the boat? Huh? Listen, I, I've been a pastor my whole adult life, 23 years old when I started pastoring. And I've watched the church criticize and judge and ridicule people that sank when they were trying to walk on the water. And the whole time they were doing it, they were sitting in the boat with a Snuggie around their necks. Listen to me. It's easy to criticize somebody that's sinking when you're sitting in the boat. But Peter had faith to get out of the boat. And listen to me. As long as Peter was fulfilling the words of that hymn and turning his eyes up on Jesus, the water was underneath his feet. But the moment he got his eyes on the winds, the moment he got his eyes on the waves, the moment he got his eyes on the storm that was surrounding him, he began to sink. And we do the same thing in our lives. If we fix our eyes upon him, we walk on the water. If we refuse to be distracted by the peripheral, we've got the victory. We're overcoming. We're doing well but when we allow Jesus to no longer be central to our vision and become peripheral and we put our eyes on the storm on the financial situation that seems unbearable on the marriage that is struggling on the children that are making bad decisions as soon as we start looking at the storm we begin to sink and we say Lord we do not know what to do listen if you read the book of revelations in the fourth chapter it's an amazing story that's happening and John is, is, sees the throne room of God. He says that there's a big throne sitting in the center of this room. And he that sits on that throne, he looks like many great precious stones. And there's a rainbow of emerald literally that surrounds this throne. And out of that throne comes lightnings and thunderings and peals of rumbling. And he said around that throne there are 24 little thrones. And on those 24 little thrones sit the 24 elders. He says they're arrayed in white garments and they have crowns on their head. He said also in that throne room there are four beasts. He said one looks like an eagle. One looks like a calf. One looks like a man. Listen, he gives this great description of these four beasts. He said they're filled with eyes before and behind from within and without. And he said those four beasts fly around that throne room crying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. He then says every time these four beasts fly and cry holy holy is the Lord those 24 men that are sitting on those little thrones they get up off of their thrones they take off their crowns they lay them at his feet and they cry worthy 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 is the Lamb of God to you you deserve the glory the power and the honor then he moves into chapter 5 and here's what he said he said I looked a little closer at the one who was sitting on the center throne and I saw something in his hand I looked a little closer and I found out that what was in his hand was a scroll and that that scroll was sealed with seven seals. He said I heard a mighty angel walk through the heavens and begin to declare with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals thereof. He said no one was found worthy. No one was found worthy in heaven. No one was found worthy on earth and no one was found worthy under the earth. He said I John fell on my face as though I were dead and I began to weep. Why was he weeping? He was weeping because the eternal plan of God was about to come to a screeching halt because no 
one was found worthy to open the scroll. Listen, he had looked around that throne room in heaven. He had saw God the Father. He looked around that throne room in heaven. He saw the disciples and the patriarchs. He looked around that throne room in heaven, and he saw four beasts that he could not describe. But no one was found worthy to take the scroll from he who sat on the throne. And he began to weep and cry. But then he said, an elder came to me, and he put his hand on my shoulder. And he said, John, weep not for the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the earth. He has overcome, and he is worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals thereof. Listen to what he says. And I, John, opened my eyes, and in the midst I saw the Lamb. The Lamb did not just magically appear there. He is pre-eternal. In the beginning was the Lamb. He, the, the Lamb did not magically appear at that moment. But John was so overwhelmed with everything that was taking place around him that he failed to turn his eyes upon Jesus. But in that moment, somebody tapped him on the shoulder. He's called an elder, and he said, son, let me help you. I know you're overwhelmed right now. I know you don't see how it's going to work out. I know you don't feel like there's any chance of this thing turning around. But I want you to look right in the middle of this situation. And there is one whose name is Jesus. He bore the sins of the world. And he can take that scroll. Listen, if you've walked into this place and you, like John, are overwhelmed with everything that's surrounding you, you're looking at everything that's peripheral in your life, and you're saying there is no way for you to get out, there's no way for you to overcome, come there's no way for you to get your up to get to the other side i've just stopped by 1846 volunteer drive to tell you to turn your eyes upon jesus stand to your feet to turn your eyes upon jesus lord we don't know what to do but our eyes Come on, psalmist. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Now, now hear me, and, and, and we've already been in the altars. I'm going to pray for you where you are. So just bear with me a minute. Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Every day of your life, you need your eyes on him. How many of you think when everything is going your way, you need your eyes on him? No sickness in your life, eyes on Jesus. No financial trouble, eyes on Jesus. A day when you're not having to give your beautiful daughter away, eyes on Jesus. Always. And, and we're pretty gifted at doing that as believers. But here's what happens. The time we need it most is in the midst of crises. But it's, it's the very thing that should make us do it more than anything else that knocks us off track. And we get our eyes on the winds and the waves, on the pressures of life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the pursuit of other things. And when we get our eyes off of Him, we start sinking. Listen to me, listen to me. You, you have to get in the posture of worship every day of your life. It, it will change your existence. If, if you will get in the posture of worship, it will change the way you view trouble. Worship is paramount. Worship is first. Worship is before walk, and worship is before war. And when you become a person of worship, and, and I, I, I need 25 more minutes, but I'm not going to take it. But listen to me. 
When you become a person of worship, God then empowers you to become a person of walk. You, you're able to walk right because your eyes are on Him. Hey, listen, he, as Pentecostals, this is one of our favorite verses. You ready? When I start quoting it, if you know it, quote it with me. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, most of the time we hear that scripture, most of the time we quote that scripture, it's, it's when we need supernatural power to overcome a situation. And, and it's real in those moments. But let me tell you when else it's real. When, when it comes to living by the commandments of this book, hear me, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit saith the Lord. If, if you're going to walk this thing out, you can't do it with willpower. You can't. You, you've got to be a person of worship. I, I'm telling you, I am preaching to people right now. You, you come to this church every Sunday. You, you engage in other spiritual calisthenics on a weekly basis. But for some reason, you can't get victory over sin to stop doing things you know you don't need to do and start walking right. Listen to me. Listen to me. If, if you're there and you say, preacher, you're preaching to me. I know you're not going to wave your hand and shout, it's me. It's me, it's me, it's me. But, but if you're there, ask yourself this question. Did you participate in our worship service this morning? Well, preacher, some of us just aren't demonstrative. Listen, somebody puts a gun to you. And, and what does this mean? What, t t what? I was, I was in Brazil. I couldn't understand a word they were saying. Portuguese. We, we've got us a new, I know we have all met our new Davis clan. We've got a foreign exchange student here from the Netherlands. Mace, is that right? Give him a hand. Tell him you're glad to have him here. So his first language is Dutch, but he speaks fantastic English and does a fantastic job. And he's here for the, for the whole year or just a semester? The whole year. He, he, he left our church service last week, and Matt and Amber asked him, how'd you like service? Remember, English is his second language. He said, that preacher talks fast. <laughs> he said, I didn't get everything he said. But I know this, Jesus will take my shame. Somebody ought to clap your hands for that. Jesus. Hey! Give me, give me, uh, give me three people, and, and I'm going to come back to this altar service in a minute. Give me three people. I need, a, I need three 20s and a 10. Let me tell you why. And, and, and y'all ought to be reaching for this in a hurry. Matt came to me today. Lots of expenses involved in getting him here and things are... God's been good to them. They have no sad songs to sing. But he said, I'm looking to get him a Dutch Bible, a Bible in Dutch. He said, it costs $70, and I'm going to get that together in the next few weeks. I said, oh, no, we're getting him a Dutch Bible bought today. So I need $70. Give me three 20s and a 10, somebody. Just uh, several people. Don't nobody give me 70. Let everybody get involved. You, you got to raise your hand fast. I'm going to stop once I get it. If you're motioning for me, call me. If you can get it in before somebody else, you'll be good. I got them in the back. We're getting, I, need, I need a 10. I need a 10. You got a 20. They, they can get a better Bible. <laughs> I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, just keep it. I'll get some. I'll take your, I'll take your money away next week, Charlie. Huh? <laughs> Who's next? Give Mace a hand. Tell him you're glad he's with us. Listen. Listen. Listen, 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 listen. In Brazil, I didn't understand Portuguese. And one night I went to a Brazilian jiu-jitsu studio. I, I couldn't understand what any of them were saying. But for a jiu-jitsu practitioner, the equivalent is this. It's called tapping out. And a world 
champion black belt was there. And he wrapped his hand around my neck, put me in a body lock, and squeezed. And I said, and he let me go because it means I surrender. Listen to me. It doesn't matter if you're demonstrative or not. It's humbling yourself to lift your hands. Do you remember when David danced in the streets? Do you remember that? He, he said, if you think I was the base today, come watch me worship tomorrow. Here's what he was saying. I don't want the identity of the king when the king is in the house. I want the identity of a worshiper. Listen to me. You, you need the identity of a worshiper. And I promise you this. If you are struggling with sin, if you will make a fresh commitment to worship, it will give you power to overcome that sin. If you believe it, clap your hands and give him praise. I'm finished. I'm finished. I'm finished. Ephesians chapter 6 gets us into war. And war comes after worship and walk. I, I know you love that chapter. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. But hear me. Before you get to Ephesians chapter 6, you have to read Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1. And here's what that says. You must walk worthy of the calling. Verse 17. You must walk in righteousness. Chapter 5, verse 2, you must walk in love. Chapter 5, verse 15, you must walk circumspectly. Here's what I'm telling you. If you're not walking right, you're not going to have any power to war when people in your life need you to do so. You've got to worship and walk, and that enables you to war in Jesus' mighty name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm going to pray for you right where you're at. I'm not calling you out. I'm not calling you to the aisle nor to the front. If you're here and you would say, Pastor, I I'm judging myself right now. And, and I'm not worshiping properly. I I'm not fixing my eyes on Jesus. I've got everything on the peripheral. And, and this morning, I want to make a commitment to be a better worshiper. I, I want to make a commitment to fix my eyes on Jesus that the cares of life that are weighing down on me will start to grow dim and that I'll find joy in His presence. If that's you, slip your hand up. Honest church, hands all over the building. Honest church, every head bowed, every eye closed. Put your hand down for a moment. If, if you're struggling to walk, if, if you've got something in your life, oh, God, speak to your people. I, I hear the voice of the Lord saying, I'm about to loose your chains. I hear the voice of the Lord saying, I'm about to lick my finger and turn the page and pick up my pen. And begin writing a brand new narrative in your life. I hear the voice of the Lord saying, this is your moment. I have designed this day for you to hear my word, to respond, and then to begin to live victorious in a way that surpasses anything you've ever known. Chains are going to be loosed. Today declares the Most High. If you're here today, and you'd say, Pastor, I, I've been struggling. I, I, I've tried to resist, but I keep falling. And, and today, through a spirit of worship, I want God to give me power to walk in righteousness, light, and love that I may be able to war properly. If that's you, slip your hand up. One, two, three, four. I can't count them. I can't count them. I can't. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Just sing that little chorus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Make him And the things of earth 
They'll go strangely dim. They'll grow strangely dim in the light of your eyes. Sing that with me, everybody. Say, turn your eyes. Oh, turn. Look close at his glorious face. And the cares of life and the will grow strangely in the light of his Slip your hands to heaven and let me bless you. Father, I bless this people. I thank you for your touch on their lives. I thank you for their desire to stand in the gap in war on behalf of those that they love. And God, I thank you today that you have you've spoke to us and said, first, we've got to worship. We, we've got to prostrate ourselves in your presence. And there we'll find power to walk victoriously. And then we'll be able to engage in spiritual conflict and do so with great result. Anoint us, God to fix our eyes upon you. Uh, let it be said of the people of South Cleveland that there are people of worship. There are people of praise. There are people who value and honor the name of Christ. And they fix their eyes on him. And that gives them power to walk and to war. God, I thank you for every life that's here. And I pray that you would impart change to them today. And that we leave this place and never ever, ever be the same again. And all of God's people said, if you thank him for his word, clap your hands and give him praise. He's going to sing you out of here, shake somebody's hand, hug their neck, and tell them you love them and God is on their side. Sing them out of here. My eyes be fixed on you. My heart be drawn to you.